and welcome to Always Take Notes. A message from our sponsor, Arvon. Do you have a story in you or want to test the waters of writing poetry or non-fiction? Maybe you already write and write well, but would like to try a new form or genre, pick up some new tricks. Enter Arvon. Arvon runs a yearly programme of in-person and online events, from five-day residential writing weeks that take place at one of their three writing houses, to a flexible online programme featuring five-week online evening courses, masterclasses and pay-what-you-can events. Arvon's courses cover everything from commercial genre and experimental fiction to poetry, screenwriting and even songwriting. They've been running creative writing courses up and down the UK since 1968. In that time, their prize-winning tutors, many of whom may be some of your favourite writers, have unlocked the creativity of over 100,000 people. Many have gone on to be published authors and career writers themselves. But actually, it's not about that. Writing with Arvon is about finding a supportive community of fellow writers, making like-minded connections that last a lifetime. By signing up for a course, you don't just get an acclaimed author as your tutor. You also gain a writing group to bounce ideas off long after the course is finished. So whether it's a cosy stay at one of their writing houses in Devon, West Yorkshire or Sleepy Shropshire, or a course you can do from the comfort of your sofa, Arvon works around your creative life. Visit arvon.org courses, that's A-R-V-O-N dot org slash courses, to learn more and give yourself the gift of writing. Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and myself spoke with the historian Bethany Hughes. We spoke to Bethany about discovering a passion for ancient history as a child, about balancing books and television work, and about her latest book, The Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. It's a great episode and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome Bethany to Always Take Notes. It's fantastic to have you on the show. Could we start with your latest book, The Seven Wonders of the Ancient World? I mean, you've come across these wonders, I imagine, many times over your career. When did you decide to sit down and and write about them? I think probably when I had conversations with people and talked to them about Seven Wonders and asked them to list them or list their favourite, and people would get to about three and then sound a bit vague and dry up because they couldn't actually remember what all seven were. And I thought, this is incredible because these are these extraordinary expressions of human ambition and power and beauty in some cases. And they've been talked about and written about and debated and painted and turned into a poems for the last uh, between two and a half and four and a half thousand years. And yet they seem mysterious to people. People almost imagine, I think, that sometimes they're made up or legends or, you know, fantasies and they're scattered across the earth. So I wanted to kind of tether them to the ground. Um, and I think that, you know, it was probably when I was in the site of Olympia 35 years ago and just experiencing it as a pilgrimage site and imagining people making a pilgrimage to the sanctuary of Olympia, but also to the great statue of Zeus it within his temple in that sanctuary and ever since then that's when I've been thinking I should I want to try to as I said I want to try to kind of communicate the reality of these of these places and could you tell us a little bit about why this idea of a kind of list of wonders is such a a sort of enduring idea we saw there have been wonders of the ancient world but also of the modern world the engineered of the natural world why is it something do you think that has such staying power as an idea but i think i think as a species we love a list it sort of it it persuades we manage to persuade ourselves by creating a list that we're imposing some kind of order on the chaos of the world and that there'll be a kind of rational logical progression to how we interact with it because really interestingly this idea of lists goes right the way back and, and in fact the very earliest extant copy we have of the Seven Wonders list from the ancient world is actually um, within a compendium of other lists. So it's a tiny fragment of papyrus that was used, in fact, to mummify a body on the banks of the Nile. And it's from a thing called the Latakuli Alexandrini, which, you know, the clues in the title, as it sounds, was a, was a book that was written in the ancient city of Alexandria. And it is a list of lists. So it lists not just the seven ancient wonders of the world. It also lists the seven best lakes, the seven finest artists, the seven best generals, the seven most wonderful springs in the world. 
And so that came from um, a time that we call the Hellenistic Age. So we're talking around 2,300 years ago, sort of after basically between Alexander the Great, the death of Alexander the Great and the death of Cleopatra the Great, Great, um, the Pharaoh Cleopatra, Queen Cleopatra. And it was an age where there was this notion, again, that kind of rationalising things, creating a taxonomy for the world was the best way to understand it, 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 very based on Aristotle's philosophy. And lists were one of the ways that those ancient women and men did it, is that they just created lists and they kind of felt that that somehow meant the world was realisable and attainable and comprehensible. So BuzzFeed has been tapping into something much more enduring than we're giving them credit for. That's completely. I mean, it is basically a BuzzFeed um, of the of antiquity. And, and kind of more than that, what I love about The Seven Wonders is it's not just a list, it's a bucket list. So it's a list of places that people can actively go to, places that people in antiquity would think, OK, these are seven things that I need to see before I die. And in fact, some of the Seven Wonders lists, because we have that original one, the Latakuli Alexandrini, but we know there were slightly older versions that have just survived as kind of references and ghosts in other texts. Um, there, there were many Seven Wonders lists that were created, but a number of them, uh, for instance, one by a man called Antipater of Sidon and one by a man called Philo of Byzantium, they're basically travel guides. So they're kind of like the Lonely Planet version of this, this is where you should go, this is what you should see. Uh, one of them actually says, you know, if you're going to stop at Rhodes, never harbour at that particular port because you'll get all your stuff ripped off by robbers. So they were very practical guides to, to going to experience these, as I said, frankly, extraordinary works of, of, of humankind. And it's a list where, you know, size really does matter because they were all the biggest of their kind, the biggest examples of a statue or of a pyramid, uh, you know, or of a... 108 foot bronze sculpture of the sun god Helios. So so they were all kind of massive constructions. So it was their size that was also being celebrated in the list. And so where did you begin your research and how did you go around managing it? And we were wondering as well, how did working on this book dovetail with what you were doing in terms of broadcast at the same time? Well, I do a lot of archaeology as well as history. And I personally cannot write about history unless I go to the place where it happened which people always say is incredibly convenient because I'm writing about the history of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East and the Caucasus and all these kind of amazing, splendid, adventurous places to go to. But I passionately, personally feel that you can only respect a people and a place if you go to try to ex physically experience and inhabit their world. And it does change my opinion and it actually often makes the sort of jigsaw puzzle of history fall into place. So... You know, I'll give you a tiny, tiny example um, with the Colossus of Rhodes, for instance. We don't know exactly where the Colossus was set up. But if I say that name, the Colossus of Rhodes, everybody listening will probably imagine uh, a huge, huge statue with the legs like that straddling uh, a harbour. But that's total fantasy. That was just something that was made up um, by a, a actually a 14th century Italian lawyer who went to Rhodes and said, oh, I think this is where, 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 the, where the statue stood. I'm sure it was straddling the two harbours. And ever since then, it's always been portrayed as that. There's no evidence for that. And engineers tell us it would be physically impossible. That statue would have toppled over if it had been straddling the harbours. But we know it was there in Rhodes, um, Rhodes Old Town. And it was only when I went by boat to Rhodes and looked up at the top of the old town, the, the ancient city, and the sanctuary of Helios, the sun god Helios, and this was a statue of the sun god Helios, right on the top of something called Monte Smith, on the top of the hill. And actually, if you imagined a huge colossal sculpture there, it, there's an optical illusion and it looks as though it's straddling the two ancient harbours beneath the military port and the civilian port. So, and I wouldn't have thought of that if I hadn't if I hadn't done that journey by boat. I wouldn't have thought about it. So it's a very long answer to your question. But I set about researching it by going to the places, by inhabiting them, by um, accessing all the very latest archaeology um, for the relating to those particular sites. And it's not just to travel to find the research. It's the experience of travel itself, which is something that I find essential when I'm when I'm writing these books. And in terms of broadcasting, um, well, it 
doesn't the the books always come first and the books are unrelated to the telly shows apart from when somebody makes a telly show about one of the books so fingers crossed or knocking on wood as I am I think that there will be a seven wonders television series but that comes always comes way after the books so you know the book on Helen or Socrates the, the telly always comes dragging after the written page how do you negotiate access to some of these archaeological sites, particularly ones that are sort of very fragile or, or protected? I think you obviously have to have the trust of the guardians and the archaeologists. And I suspect it's because I've been travelling to these places, um, in some cases, for 40 years. So um, I have friends on the ground and contacts on the ground. And also, I do think that people know that you're not going to barrel in and sensationalise what's going on, which is for an archaeologist is obviously a nightmare. Um, we can probably refer to some of the current archaeology series on Netflix, for instance, which are sort of all a conspiracy theory about, you know, massive truths that are being concealed from the populate the human population by archaeologists. So archaeologists, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, and I, I guess it's, um, I, you know, you just, you have to... You have to go with good intention, I think. You, and it, it has to be clear to those people that you are going really to try to celebrate the story of, of the place. Some of them are quite spiky. It gingers up my life, the experience of going to them. So, you know, the Great Pyramid, I, I had to crawl in underneath this subterranean chamber that goes 70 metres or so down underneath the Great Pyramid into the bedrock itself. And I am quite claustrophobic and I don't like the dark what a stupid profession I've chosen and this is a chamber that gets narrower and narrower and darker and darker as you go down and eventually you have to be crawling on your hands and knees so it was for me not a pleasant experience but it was an incredible historical experience for two reasons one is that you're up close to the the millions of chisel marks in the that are actually on the bedrock itself so suddenly you are seeing the places where probably men rather than women would have chiseled underneath the pyramid to try to create this incredible chamber and also the air is filled with salt and if you touch the walls salt just comes off on your hand and that is because 50 million years ago the bedrock of the great pyramid was sea so Again, it just short circuits you into the the worlds of those people that often on whose backs and with whose blood and sweat and tears these things were created. But it but it just for a second it allows you to be in two times at once and to and to really empathise with their world as well as understanding the these extraordinary monuments historically. Is that level of of kind of intact remain that you have at Giza is that exceptional compared to the other sites? I mean, we saw that you'd mentioned often that you know there is not a lot left, or what there is left is inaccessible. Yeah, it it is exceptional. So this huge irony that the Great Pyramid of Giza is the oldest of all of the Seven Wonders, so four thousand five hundred years old. Actually, we now know four thousand six hundred years old because of incredible new new research and archaeology, um, and yet it's the one that survives almost virtually intact. There are fragments of all of the others. The only one that we can't for certain say that we've identified its exact footprint um, is the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which again is quite ironic because when you talk to people about the Seven Wonders, I found, I don't know about you two, but I found that that's the one that everybody remembers. If you say, tell me about the Seven Wonders, people will go, oh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, you know, that's, that's the one... That's my favourite, or, or that's the one that um, I'd have most liked to see. But it's the only one that we don't know exactly where it was, because it was, was possibly in Babylon. It was possibly 100 miles to the north in Nineveh, the ancient city of, of Nineveh. So we're still looking for the remains. But we have descriptions, detailed, detailed descriptions of the Hanging Gardens, and all of the others exist in some form, however fragmentary. Um, you know, the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, uh, the great tomb of King Mausolus, which is in Bodrum, modern day Bodrum on the Turkish coast. Uh, you can go and walk round it. You can see the steps where Mausolus's body would have been carried down into his grave. The, the statue of Zeus at Olympia was burnt down in a massive fire 
actually in ancient Constantinople when it was carried from Greece to Asia Minor. Um, but you can see where it would have stood in the temple, the Colossus of Rhodes I've, I've described as well, um, and the Pharos Lighthouse of Alexandria. If you go to that, you can still walk around where the base of the of the lighthouse would have been because there's a modern day fort that's been built on it and you can see some of the ancient lovely red granite blocks that were used in the original construction you can see some of the blocks on the seabed at Alexandria and the temple of Artemis at Ephesus um, that one of the columns still stands so you have to go and use your imagination but they are all still there and all still visitable when 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 I brought the book out as I've been talking to, you know, doing the doing the usual thing, going around the country, talking to people about the book. And there's brilliant two brothers who I've basically fallen in love with, who were kind of middle aged dads. And they've bonded as as grown up brothers by going and visiting all of the sites of the Seven Wonders, including Iraq. So so including Babylon. So I was incredibly impressed by their dedication to um, uh, historical discovery. That's excellent. Maybe they'll produce a, a rival book. Yes, <laughs> or a rival telly series. I'd watch that. They they loved it. Was their brotherly love for each other was so so joyous to to witness. I wondered if the chapter on the Hanging Gardens of Babylon was harder to write as a result of the sort of lack of physical evidence. Um, you talk in that chapter about choosing informed conjecture rather than fake certainty. Was it was it harder to create a sense of kind of narrative satisfaction or did you find that just laying out the different bits of evidence was was enough? It's really, really good question. that, And really interesting because of all of them, it's possibly the one that's been written about most. So we get these, as I said, detailed descriptions of how it looked, of the engineering, of the of the bitumen, which is a kind of ancient petrochemical that was used for waterproofing, for building, how bitumen was used to line the water channels. So you could have this sort of steeped mountain of planting. I sort of imagine it like kind of giant outsized window boxes, kind of looking a bit like, um, you know, we go to a posh wedding and they have those champagne towers. It's I kind of imagine, imagine it was the sort of garden equivalent of that. So you get these very, very detailed descriptions from um, contemporaries or near contemporaries or people who who travelled with soldiers, who went to Babylon. So I suspect that these are so close to the um, to the event and to the place that, that we can rely on them as historical sources, some, some of them, obviously not all of them. What was interesting, I had kind of history on my side in, in terms of the, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. But what I was very actively trying to do with the book and what's been so fascinating about the research of, um, of it is... It, it just occurred to me that these places weren't just massive. They weren't just kind of outsized show-off monuments. They were created because they incarnated in some way the preoccupations of the age that created them. And they also, each of them, tell us something special and important about how we operate as, as humans. And in the case of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, it's really fascinating. So they were made probably in the 7th or the 6th century BCE. And this is the Iron Age. So it's a time when iron uh, agricultural implements and iron weapons have been developed, which means that we can control the earth um, in a much more comprehensive way than humans could in the Bronze Age, when there was just largely just kind of bronze, bronze weaponry and uh, bronze agricultural instruments. And this is a time when you have, for instance, the, the book of Genesis is set down, when we hear about man being given dominion over the earth and animals. And if you read the sources from the Middle East and the Near East, so, so from the kind of purview of the kings that created the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, it's very clear that they're basically kind of extreme gardeners. So these are kings who storm into another's territory and they don't just enslave the populations. They don't just take over land. They prove how powerful they are by physically moving the vegetation of one nation into their homeland. So they describe, you know, that they ripped open mountains with iron picks and axes. This is Sennacherib, King Sennacherib of Assyria. Nebuchadnezzar the Great also boasts about 
bringing giant um, cedars of Lebanon and floating them in the Euphrates as though they were matchsticks. So they, they tell the world how potent and powerful they are by telling them how they have control over nature itself. And, and that's a really, really important shift in our psychology, because up until that point, particularly if you think of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which was basically a giant resurrection machine for the for the pharaoh Khufu, so that he could go in, or the King Khufu, we should, I, I, we sh- you shouldn't really call them pharaohs until the new kingdom, just, just FYI, so King Khufu, um, for him to kind of rejoin the cosmos and the stars, because the ancient Egyptians knew that at a molecular level, we are part of the universe. But by the time you get to the Iron Age, people are trying to persuade themselves that we have control over Mother Earth and over nature itself. So, so um, yes, yeah, so it was harder in some ways because I wasn't able to go to one single archaeological site um, <clears throat> to look at the Hanging Gardens. But it was easier in others because there's been so much written about it and it's, and it's really clear what the Hanging Gardens were, were doing for con- the contemporaries um, who created them. We wanted to come back to the new book uh, in due course, but could we roll back now to your early life and your initial interest in history and writing? We saw that your mum used to write history books with the local vicar at the kitchen table. Is that right? Could you tell us about that? (laughs) Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that. Well, yes, she did. I mean, she was an amazing woman. She was an actor, came from a family of kind of rackety, out of work actors and and writers and yeah she, they used to do kind of guides to local festivals and you know birds and the kind of mythology of birds so I remember her sitting and writing longhand at the kitchen table at the end of a day having looked after us as as a, as a mum and then I'd notice she would be doing it before breakfast in the morning as well so yeah so she produced a lot of work I mean I think the the, the interest in history uh, I mean, they both left, you know, mum left school at 16, dad left school at 14. So they weren't academic historians by any stretch of the imagination. But they knew that stories mattered, that the stories of other people mattered and that communicating ideas and stories mattered. So I think it was almost by osmosis I sort of picked up this notion. Um, it, it was very unpopular when I started um, started out my life as a baby historian. You know, I was being told this was the 80s and then into the 90s, and I was being told that history was irrelevant, that the year 2000 was coming, and that there was going to be this massive kind of reset button pressed, and all the answers would be in the future, and that we were, we were basically, you know, hopeless, romantic degenerates who you know I mean you know in a very sort of serious way who shouldn't really be entertained that what we were saying was was potentially dangerous you know um uh if if not entirely irrelevant um so I think there was a part of me genuinely that was kind of bloody minded and just thought you know so many people are saying no. So many people are saying this is this isn't something that I should pursue. That it's a kind of dead end. Particularly studying dead languages, you know, dead societies. Uh, that it was a pointless exercise. That it put fire in my belly and just made me think. Well, I, I, you're wrong. <laughs> so I need to I need to prove you wrong um, and and embrace it with even more open arms. It sounds like the fire is in your belly already, though, because I read somewhere that you wrote your first book when you were four or five on Tutankhamun. Can you tell us more about that? That's right. It's somewhere. You can see I'm in a study like around with books. It's somewhere around here. So, yeah, so I was exposed to the amazing Tutankhamun exhibition of 1972 when the, the, the famous golden face mask of Tutankhamun came over to the British Museum um, to London. And I remember watching the television programme about it as well and being just blown away. I mean, just being mesmerised by this notion that suddenly all the fairy tales that I'd heard of boy kings being buried with immeasurable gold of mysterious deaths of hidden tombs, that this was true. This was real. This was something that actually happened. And so I wrote my first book. It was a history book, which was my uh, thesis on how Tutankhamun died. I wrote some mosquitoes, S-U-M, mosquitoes, who were a bit germy, bit him and he died, which I have to say I'm quite proud of because it turns out that boy, almost certainly he had malaria and that was one of the reasons he was so weak and his immune system was weakened and and, and probably one of the reasons he died. Um, and, yeah, so, I, you know, I wrote it and illustrated it and did a big 
an end sort of frame saying and on the television you can see it which was very prophetic so but it just shows that you know importance of being exposed to the other when you when you're a child and I you know for me that is civilization is when we understand we welcome across our threshold strangers strange goods strange ideas and there's a very beautiful word that's that's used um from from the kind of deep past onwards from around five thousand six thousand years ago onwards a root of um gosti g-h-o-s-t-i which gives us the words guest and host and originally it was one and the same thing and it can a ghost can be a visitor who's either welcome or or unwelcome but it was this notion that gosti was that exactly as i said that that's what we need to do we need to take the risk of welcoming the unknown across our across our doorway and that's the only way that we will survive as and thrive as a species and the only way that any form of society or civilization can happen so so yeah so show your kids pictures of Tutankhamun. Can you tell us about your your first steps into the kind of professional world we saw you studied ancient and modern history at university and then you had this chance to do a extra academic year at the V&A but then did a, a brief stint as a silk painter. I mean, how did you go about kind of working, taking your steps into the into the world you inhabit now? Well, that was definitely me being romantic. So exactly that. So I had um I had this scholarship to do um uh, an extra diploma in uh, history of art, and I just thought this is too easy, you know. I need to be, it's kind of the, 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 the equivalent of me travelling out to, to Rhodes to imagine the Colossus of Rhodes. I thought, I've got to go and experience what it's like to be a medieval apprentice. <laughs> and somebody offered me an apprenticeship in silk painting. I thought, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going, I'm going to kind of become, you know, a craftswoman. And this, this is how I'm going to kind of understand how people create. I don't need to be sitting around with loads of posh people doing, doing you know, V&A diplomas. And I have to say that was a disastrous decision. <laughs> and I left within, oh God, I really don't know, a month or something that I was basically just being, you know, sat in an attic and not really learning anything and kind of satisfying, you know, someone else's ideal of, of, of silk painting, by which I'm, of course, I'd lost my place at the V&A. And that was one moment where I wish somebody else had given me some advice. I wish somebody had said, oh, no, 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 hang on a second. You know, the silk painting can happen anytime. Go and do the diploma. So, um, yeah, so I'd say, you know, in terms of life defining, it was a brave decision and it felt like it was the bold, true, truthful, you know, decision to make at the time. But actually, I should have made life easier for myself and just just uh, gone and gone and done that V&A degree. So after the silk painting stint, um, how did you then make your way into the world of television and and how did you come to make your first show in 2000? So two two things. So I was then uh, back doing academic research and looking at um, uh, figurines of old Europe. Uh, I've always been very interested in kind of how women are represented and there's this really extraordinary fact that if you look at the human figures made between around 50,000 BCE and around 4,000 BCE, 94% of them are of the female form. So kind of what humans were doing were making images of women. Uh, for whatever reason, we still don't know. You, you know, we can imagine why, but we still don't know for certain why. So I was looking at these figurines. There are um, a lot of them you find on the borders of Romania and, and Hungary. And I was up in um, Tigamurej and uh, woke up one night and heard gunfire and it was the uh, Romanian revolution happening. And it was a real epiphany for me that it suddenly felt like it was really important for to have somebody who could think across time and try to make sense of the contemporary world with an understanding of the deep past of a place. And it wasn't something I'd really thought about doing up until then, but I just, because I'd taken recording equipment to record interviews about these old figurines, I happened to have some recording equi equipment with me and did interviews with people. And I think sort of weirdly, that was the first time I thought it ever crossed my mind that creating material for broadcast could be something that could dovetail with academic and historic research. So it was partly that. And again, you've probably read, read this story that um, in the 1990s, so slightly later in the 1990s, um, I had a meeting with a BBC producer who told me that 
no one's interested in history anymore. Nobody watches history programmes on television. Nobody wants to be lectured at by a woman. So again, I thought, well, you need proving proving wrong. So that was a kind of no that gave me the energy and impetus, I think, to, to continue. And then in 2000, and I, I was working on this in 2000, um, uh, it actually, I think, came out in 2002. So initially I was working on the story of the women of Sparta. And I, Sparta's a fascinating ancient society, so strange, weird, such an outlier, so successful in some ways, so brutal in others. Um, this kind of strange utopian state uh, where all men and of a particular uh, class were considered equal, but um, a, a society that enslaved a whole populations of other Greeks. But the women there had, had power and status and stand, standing, unlike they had anywhere else in the ancient world at the time. So women were allowed to eat the same rations as men. They were allowed to drink wine. They were allowed to travel in chariots. They were allowed to exercise all of these things which were denied uh, women. Uh, other women in the Greek world and I just thought why is nobody told their story why is nobody made this popular whenever I hear about the Spartans all I hear is about the kind of macho warriors so I was I just was doggedly taking this idea into broadcasters and it took four or five years before anybody said yes so that eventually came out in 2002 but meanwhile the OU was doing um a series which on the face of it sounded incredibly dull so it was a a series about records of different kinds i.e. tax records and church records and this was coming out um to coincide with the anniversary of the doom the thousand year anniversary of the doomsday book um and um i ended up sort of randomly doing this doing this uh, series again being told that nobody would take me seriously and you know it was really problematic that that i was female so it was it was you know it was definitely it was i was swimming in very choppy waters at the beginning and uh, i really remember you know this is this is something that i've learned professionally never to do i really remember with the spartans show nobody said well done or how great they thought it was until they'd seen the overnight ratings. And it went out, I think, on a Saturday or something. And I remember being called by somebody from from Channel 4 saying, isn't Spartans looking great? Because it did really well. And I said to them, well, it was looking great on Friday night, but it's really interesting that you only think it's looking great now that, you know, that, that, that it's, it's a success that you can that you can kind of attach yourself to. So, yeah, it wasn't it, it wasn't easy, but, you know, life life is is isn't easy and we're incredibly lucky and privileged and blessed in who we are and what we can we can do. So we're, we're lucky to have that the minimal minor hardships that that we do in comparison to what most other people are, are dealing with. With most of the time. Could you tell us about how your first book, Helen of Troy, published in 2005, came about? And then also, you know, from that point onwards, what are your thoughts on the, the relative merits of, of broadcast and of, uh, you know, writing or books as a, as a medium or a vehicle to convey history? Uh, well, Helen of Troy, it was the, my first sort of general trade monograph that was for, for the general public. I wrote it because, again, I just thought people always write about Achilles and Theseus and Hector. What about Helen? You know, she's the cause of it all. And I was really sick of the fact that her beauty, right up until when I was writing in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, was still described as a problem. It was problematic. You know, the ancient Greeks had this name that they gave to the first created woman. They called her the Kalon Kakon, the evil uh, beautiful evil thing evil because she was beautiful beautiful because she was evil and Helen absolutely was a summation of that idea and yet if you actually look at her story first of all her appearance isn't described in any detail until the fourth century CE by somebody called Quintus of Smyrna who talks about her sort of navy blue eyes she's always described as golden but it wasn't what she looked like it was her how she made people feel how she impacted on people so I wanted to kind of rescue her from three and a half thousand years of of misogyny and, and but again when I was writing that book 
people said, oh, you know, it's such a fluffy subject. <laughs> you know, you're not going to do yourself any favours by writing about such a fluffy, a fluffy character. Um, you know, how wrong, how wrong they could be in terms of her. She's the opposite of fluffy. She's the most feisty, ferocious, ferocious creature I think I've ever encountered in history, history or myth or literature. Um, so I, it was a passion project. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It was, I was ferociously passionate about getting Helen's story out there, both the story of a Bronze Age aristocrat and um, the reception of Helen through time. And, you know, you ask about television and and books as a as a means of communicating history uh, i you know the thing i adore about broadcasting is that it just opens a door for people and they go through and then they can follow their own path and do a deeper dive and it but it's really 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 important to open that door it's really 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 important to get stories um, and voices out there to, to be a kind of vessel for other stories and voices that wouldn't normally end up on screen. So, you know, we're, we're, we're filming at the moment in, in the Caucasus, in Albania, um, in the empty quarter, in, in sort of parts of the world that don't normally get on to primetime television. And, you know, again, we really fought to do that so that it's not just Greeks and Romans and Tudors and Nazis and ancient Egyptians. It's sort of proving that history happens everywhere. And um, I think it's the most delicious way of communicating ideas. You, you have to, I remember Simon Sharma saying this to me, that how sick he was of people saying to him that he was dumbing down by doing television history. And him saying, actually, the mental gymnastics that are needed to, to I mean, you both know this as journalists, to reduce and compress a really complex idea or timeline into a 30 second piece to camera. Or, you know, if you think about it, a, a, a normal television documentary probably uses about 5,000, 6,000 words. So half the number of words that you'd get in a single chapter of a book. But that means that every word counts, that every word has to carry the weight of weight of 100. So, you know, it's not perfect. And obviously there are always ways that we can get better and there are pitfalls and flaws. But, but I, I, I think it's really important when there's so much that's inauthentic and uh, downright fallacious and enraging that comes out of the rectangle that people have in their homes or hands or, uh, you know, sitting rooms or bedrooms. It's really, really, really important to try to get pure history and archaeology out there on the screen and onto the pages of a book. Do you think that working in TV has um, shaped your your craft or your method of writing? You know, do you use lots of visual aids? Do you think visually when you're structuring a chapter or is it are they separate kinds of methodologies? Yeah, again, it's, really, it's a really, really good question. When we're communicating now, if you think about it, if I said to you, what did you, you do last weekend? What would come to the fore of your mind wouldn't be a series of black lines on a piece of paper. It would be images, you know. So we, we remember visually, we rationalise visually. We don't actually rationalise through the written, the written word. The, the kind of haptic process of writing is really, really helpful. Um, or typing, but uh, we remember things visually. So it's it, I find that they're very sympathetic as as um, media because actually um, what I'm trying to communicate through the history books is often the the impression of a place or of a time or of a person, and you you want to do that. Um, so there's a visual impression left in the reader's mind. So I think it's. I think it's helped, you know, I think it, I think it definitely helps. And there's just a kind of general thing, both from travelling a lot um, around the world and meeting people, both the extremely rich and the extremely poor and the extremely privileged and the extremely underprivileged. And you always have to think, does it matter what I'm writing? Is it worth, worth somebody giving up half an hour of their busy, complicated lives to read what I'm putting down on the page. So I think actually just the physical process of engaging with the world, which travelling around the world to make television programmes forces you to do, helps you. It, it's very humbling. You know, it makes you sort of think, what is it? Who am I to be sharing any ideas at all or to be taking up anybody's time or to be, you know, causing paper to be produced to, to print words? So so it's a very, it's a good 
corrective, I think. You know, it's a sort of, it's quite Socratic in a way. It makes you think, you know, what all the, his famous lines of the wise man is the man who knows he knows nothing. It, 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 it Making television weirdly makes you feel like that as a writer. So so you have to make sure that, as I said, there's a, there's a point in doing what you do. What is the division of your time these days between the broadcast projects and the books? How does that work? I always think I'm slightly like a Benedictine nun. So it's a sort of, you know, my life is divided perfectly into into thirds. So there's the academic work, the writing the books and doing television. But of course, in terms of time, they often overlap. So when I'm sitting, uh, you know, on a plane or in the back of a, of a van or in a Bedouin tent, waiting for the sun to rise or whatever it is, then I will be writing. I've got these these notebooks, you know, just even now I'm talking to you, I have to have the notebook by my side because it's got everything. It's got all my thoughts and ideas in it. So I'll always have a notebook with me while I'll be setting down thoughts for the book. But, you know, it's very, very important that there isn't an imbalance in those three because they all feed into each other and inform one another. It's a rule of the show that we ask guests about money. So how does the division, and be as open or as guarded as you like, how does the division for your income work amongst those three different kind of uh, projects? Well, my accountant would love it if I could tell you that, because I am, I'm not, I'm really, really careful with money, but I am very vague about it in terms of not, not, I'd, you know, happily tell you, but I have, I find it too stressful to try to force um, to to kind of force an income out of projects, which could just make mean that I wouldn't I wouldn't embark on a huge number of them, you know. So if you sort of think about it, I don't know, you know, the Helen book and the Istanbul book took ten years each to write, and if you look at what my advance was, it definitely wasn't covered by the by the advance. So I don't I th- I would say they're pretty equal actually. Um, I think they're probably probably about about equal. It's a funny thing with telly. People always imagine it's like a sort of, you know, it's a license to print to print money. But um, you know, sadly not. Unless it's unless you write a kind of, you know, Netflix hit, then it's just it's a kind of educational, you know, that it has an educational purpose. So I'd say probably I'm just trying to sort of think about it. Probably it's pr- probably equal between all three of them. And with other um, historians we've had on the show who write for a broad audience, we've had very interesting conversations about their relationships with the academy, as it were, with you know people who are in universities and, and things like that. How, how do you find those interactions that you have with, with traditional academic historians? Are? Well, it started off so badly because this was a time when if you did any television you were told that you were dumbing down so in at the end of the 1990s and the beginning of the 2000s there was this notion that you were not a serious historian if you did if you did television which was one of the reasons I did it because as I said you know earlier in the conversation my parents didn't go to university they didn't even get through school so a lot of the learning that they got was definitely from books but also from television from watching television programs and I just thought it was incredible incredibly important that the academy should be reaching out um, on the mass media of course this is for the before the generation of, of, of digital or social media but um, through mass media to, to reach people who wouldn't normally have access to, to that kind of research or to the chance to go to those places so it was sniffy at first but pretty quickly as well if you think that was a time when things were changing it was a time when Simon Sharma's series about English history, British history first came out. So there was suddenly this notion that people were beginning to watch history um, on television and that you could be academically robust and make a TV show. So although it was terrible at first, I mean, it was really, you know, it was really, really appalling. And if I'd wanted to be a full time career academic at that stage, I would not have been allowed to make television programmes. It's not like it would have been frowned on. It wouldn't have been something that would have been um, considered possible or viable. But it was a time of change as well. So now, well, actually, over the last 20 years, the relationship with everybody in the academy has been fantastic because people are delighted that you're sharing uh, their research with a wider audience. By my conversations with other um, academics and colleagues, that's what keeps my history and archaeology honest. And I learn a huge amount from the students as well. So I remember giving a, a lecture in America about Socrates 
and talking about the fact that, you know, when he was operating, democracy was this big, bold, brave, dangerous idea. And one of the things that happened in Athens when democracy was first um, adopted by the Athenian city-state was that the kind of well-born or, you know, the kind of pushy opinion formers in society would call their eldest sons Democrates. So they'd give them the name democracy. And I was sort of saying, oh, you know, that wouldn't, that would hardly happen today. And this was pretty soon after the Arab Spring. And somebody put their hand up and said, that has still happens and one of the progenitors of the the revolution in um, Tahrir Square got a text from his wife who said I've just been uh, I've just given birth to a baby girl what should I call her and he texted back and said her name must be Facebook because for him Facebook was the thing that had the political agent that had sparked the the revolution, so, and I would not have known that unless that student had had told me. So, um, so yeah, so uh, you know, I, 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 it's a, it's a joyous relationship. I saw that you've co-founded your own production company, um, and I wondered why you wanted to do that. Whether that was for reasons of editorial control, or whether it was a case of it allowed you to make you know, particular projects of ambition. I saw, for instance, your Greek Island Odyssey TV show, which um, I'm sure listeners would love to hear about. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. So this this company called Sandstone Global, Sandstone because all the best ancient monuments, you know, from, from Petra onwards are built of sandstone. Um, and you're absolutely right. It was very, very specifically to maintain more editorial control and just to have a kind of quality control in terms of the level of research. Because if you come in as a academic or a presenter to another production company you can have input but there'll always be a lot of people that you that you've that you've not necessarily worked with before and there'll be an exec and there'll be a commissioner above the exec and then there'll be a studio boss you know above the commissioner who will all have an opinion and I set it up with two other women, with uh, Ruth Sessions and Shula Subramaniam, all of whom are steeped in history and the classics. And we just really wanted to basically take control of the conversation and push through exactly, as you say, projects that we thought mattered and that we knew people would watch. So we made six parts on the Greek Odyssey for Channel 5. You know, people wouldn't have thought that... I don't think the BBC would commission six parts on on the, you know, following the trail of, of the ancient Greek hero Odysseus. But Channel 5 did... As you probably know, lots of people watched it through through lockdown. We, our last day of filming was the very first day of lockdown, so we just managed to to get it in, um, and it's meant exactly that that we've done all kinds of things. So we worked with Lupita Nyong'o um, and travelled with her to Benin to talk about the true stories of Wakanda and female armies. Uh, we we took Camilla Thurlow back to Cambodia to kind of reanimate her career as somebody who cleared mines. Um, We've worked with people working on the borders of Syria who are running projects with women who are retraining as stonemasons, so so women who are refugees and have lost all the men in their lives, uh, but are are now being able to retrain as heritage stonemasons. You know, and I would never have got those projects off the ground if I'd been going cap in hand to a broadcaster or to another production company. So it just means through sheer sheer force of will and not leaving a room until somebody says, yes, you know, we can we can make them happen. Um, So, yes, you're absolutely right. It was it was so that we could continue to generate work that we thought mattered and to work with it, our tagline is the best work by the best people for the best reasons but the best people means the right people it just doesn't mean necessarily the obvious people but people as i said um, before whose whose voices should be heard um or whose approaches to life don't normally get on television so um so yeah it was a it was a punt it was an experiment but sandstone globals you know going going well so there we are Anybody who's listening, who has a dream, make it happen. Uh, you know, because you, you just, you just, as I said, if you believe in something, you'll be amazed how difficult heart people find it to say no to you if you're passionate about something. We saw um, that via the Iris project, you are involved in promoting Latin and Greek in schools. I was wondering, what are your thoughts on, what is the argument that you, you put forward for doing that? And particularly, what do you think of the merits of studying those languages vis-a-vis modern languages? 
Well, I mean, you know, a very obvious immediate merit is that if you study Latin, then you're immediately studying the root of 32 European languages. So, you know, you've got a you've got a head start before you've even started studying another modern language. Um, I, again, it seems to me appalling that subjects can be considered elitist subjects when they're only elite if they're only reserved for elite institutions. That's the only thing that makes something elite. And there are fascinating studies um, in the States, for instance, where two parallel classes, um, one was taught Latin, the other wasn't. And the extraordinary number of pupils from the classes that weren't taught Latin that ended up um, uh, uh, offending with criminal records, whereas in comparison to those that were taught Latin, because they knew that they were clever. They knew that they had something that made them stand out in society. They knew that they had something that was of real value, that wasn't just something that they nicked. So there, there are, you know, many cogent examples of its actual benefit. And also just, I think, it's the most extraordinary way to learn about the world. So, you know, if I had my way, the, the, the brilliant poet from Lesbos, Sappho, would be on all universal curricula, partly because she's open minded, partly because she just describes the extraordinary madness of first love when she talks about fire creeping under your skin and, uh, you know, you being kind of dazed by the moon. And she talks about love as being bittersweet, although she's more realistic and she says it's sweet and then it's bitter but you think you know this is a woman again over two and a half thousand years ago who has really cogent life lessons for young people particularly I think particularly teenagers and it suddenly feels like you've got an ally across time if you read read a Sappho poem it feel makes you feel that you're not alone so so you know we could talk for we could have a week's worth of 24 7 podcast talking about the value of, of latin and greek but but it really it works pupils want it parents want it teachers want it so it feels incredibly important that it's um you know it's something which is accessible to as many as many young people um in the uk and beyond as possible we've come to the end of our time so as a final question from me a theme of of this conversation has been some of the sexism you faced when you when you first set out i wondered how much you think things have changed i'm thinking in particular of the of the wave of interest in feminist retellings of of ancient ancient greek stories for instance do you think people are, are more open minded now and and more eager to hear about overlooked women's histories and more eager to hear from women on history or do you think that's a select few that that they're experiencing um, (laughs) the benefits? I mean there's always there's always so much further to go isn't there and again it's kind of both the joy and the horror of being a historian that you have a very big perspective in terms of time and you know I look at the story of society and I know that the last time I see any really kind of sustained and systematic equality between women and men is around three and a half thousand years ago so there is a lot of catching up to do you know I'm very aware of the scale of the project but you're absolutely right the very good thing is that things are changing there's absolutely no doubt about it so when uh, one of my daughters who's now 27 when she was at school and and she was asked at her school who calls themselves a feminist she was the only person who put up their hands but now I would imagine that you would get a whole full of 13 and 14 12 13 14 year olds who would who would um, happily claim that they were feminist so that is change I mean that is real quantum change so there is a long way to go um, but things you know we're a strange old species because we're so set in our ways and stubborn and you know blinkered and then we just decide to change and it happens you know it's one of the kind of beauties of us that we can make the right decisions as well as the wrong ones so we're heading long way to go but we're definitely heading in the right direction well look bethany thank you very much for a a fascinating and wide-ranging conversation and wishing you all the best with your projects going forward yeah lovely lovely to chat to you both That was your Take Notes interview with Bethany Hughes. Her latest book, The Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, is published by Weidenfeld and Nicholson. Her website is bethanyhughes.co.uk and she's on Twitter at Bethany Hughes. Hello, it's us again. Simon, what was your takeaway from the interview with Bethany? The thing that stuck in my mind is her, um, her stalwart defence of studying classical languages which I'm not sure I agree with, but I think it was, uh, you know, as opposed to to modern languages, but I thought, you know, it was sort of elegantly put and sort of interesting to hear from someone who 
has straddled that divide between broadcast and writing books, which is something that I think a lot of contemporary historians do. So, um, yeah, I thought she was, and, you know, very, you know, a very good and effervescent kind of performer. You can see when she does, she does well on TV. What about you, Rachel? Yes, I thought um, the way she talked about her relationship with the Academy was interesting and it was a, a counterpoint to some of the other interviews we've done with with historians. Um, and likewise, I think she was a, a passionate guest who had so much detail and information you know, readily accessible, which is always a sign of someone who's at the top of their game. And her book as well, I found to be very, very detailed, but um, accessible. What have you been up to, Simon? I have done the kind of concluding bit pretty much in my new book project, so this um ski mountaineering race in the Alps there was um as we were discussing off air a lot of drama because it wasn't clear what was going to happen and uh one of the races was cancelled and another was postponed but at the last minute um I was able to take part in the sole race that was going on um which was kind of grueling but fascinating and provided the the big finale that I needed for the project so I feel it's almost like a big weight has been lifted off my back um I've been um Continuing to read this book by Geoffrey Winthrop Young, this mountaineer come poet, which I was talking last time about his rather impenetrable Edwardian prose style, which I can inform the listeners has become no no more uh, brief and succinct in the last hundred pages. But I've also um, started reading the, the new Adam Higginbottom in preparation for a interview that we've got coming up with him. I'm glad that you said that it was a, a weight off your back as if you don't now have to go and write the book. I've written quite a lot of it already. But yeah, I feel that bit I have a bit more control over, if that makes sense. Of course. Anyway, Rachel, what about you? What have you been up to? What have I been up to? I have been reading Sir Salman Rushdie's uh, quite extraordinary memoir of the brutal attempt on his life in 2022. Um, I also heard him speak at the South Bank Centre the weekend before last and he was excellent. I've also got a few books on my bedside table, um, Coco Mellers' forthcoming novel and a non-fiction book called Tits Up, which is about breasts in popular culture, which I'm sure will be very fun. Um, and other than that, just been busy with research and writing for a couple of pieces. So it's all go at the minute, but but that's great. Very good to hear. Um, this has been Always Take Notes, hosted by me, Simon Aikham. And me, Rachel Lloyd. Our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our score is by Jess Danheiser, and our graphic design is by James Edgar. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're on Instagram at Always Take Notes, on Twitter at Take Notes Always. You can support us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon under Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes or get in touch with us via our website, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye. Thank you.